Great, we're live now. So I wanted to welcome everyone back to our speaker series. We are starting a month in uh, with our October speaker series speaker, Adam Bunkadeko. And um, he'll be starting in just a moment. I want to introduce him first, but also welcome everybody back to our speaker series and hope you enjoy um, Adam's presentation and what's to come in the coming months. So please do join us and you can watch all of our speaker series events on our YouTube channel as well. Um, great, so welcome Adam. Um, before I introduce you, I just want to see where you are joining from and how's your day going? Uh, good, and it's in Brooklyn, uh, actually at my uh, sister's house, so yeah. That's Amazing, it's a rainy day in New York City. It is a rainy day. I'm lucky to have a sister who will take me in uh, on a rainy day. <laughs> Always. Um, great. So again, welcome. And Adam is a candidate for Congress in New York's 9th Congressional District. Adam's parents are war refugees who fled Uganda's turbulent civil war to seek sanctuary and opportunity in the United States. A product of the New York City public school system, Adam was fortunate enough to earn scholarships to attend prep school and college. He is one of the first members of his family to graduate from college and earn a graduate degree. He received a BA from Har Haverford College, where he studied political science and philosophy, and an MBA from Harvard Business School. So welcome again, and take it away. I'm excited to hear about uh, your journey towards leadership. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me take part. Uh, I hope this will be somewhat insightful to those who are listening, and I look forward to questions and to sharing uh, whatever sort of insight that I've been able to collect over the years. Um, but I think a helpful thing to sort of start off was just who am I? I think a lot of people might be wondering what's going, who this is. So I'm uh, running for Congress in the ninth district. Um, I've spent most of my career in public service and I've tried to pay forward the sacrifices um, my family made for me growing up. Um, after college, I started off as an organizer uh, for the Working Families Party. Uh, I knocked doors and collected petitions for candidates and causes I thought were going to make a difference in the lives of folks who live in central Brooklyn. Uh, from there, I went off to Bed-Stuy Restoration Corporation, where I helped create a support network for folks who are low income uh, to help them improve the outcomes for their own children. So kind of like folks who grew up just like me. Um, and over the last couple of years served on the community board here in Crown Heights and in Prospect Heights. Uh, and before that, and before running for Congress the first time was uh, a director for business initiatives at Brooklyn Community Services. Um, as uh, Atala mentioned, I'm the son of war refugees uh, who came to this country fleeing a turbulent civil war. From what I understand, many of y'all have parents who are uh, immigrants, some of whom may be refugees. Um, so this country means a lot to us um, in many ways because uh, it was a safe haven when things were going uh, to, to really a bad place in Uganda uh, when, uh, before I was born. And so went to public schools here uh, as a child um, and uh, managed to earn a scholarship to go to a boarding school and to Haverford College uh, and eventually go to Harvard Business School. Um, and so uh, part of what I think is sort of helpful to understand sort of the context in which I, I, I come from uh, is uh, these two pictures. Um, there were pictures that sort of are, are one of my the one bedroom house that I grew up in uh, and my parents in particular. So uh, my dad and my mom are sitting on the couch uh, to the left or to to you, to y'all's right, I guess this is on uh, the right. And then it's my mom who's cooking. And I be believe that's either me in her womb or uh, my younger sister, unclear, um, I'm not sure which one of us is in there. Um, but uh, that house or apartment really meant a lot to us when we were kids um, because we spent, at least I spent the first 15 years uh, of uh, my life uh, having grown up in that tiny little place. And so 
Um, but that place, I think, for my parents was even uh, pretty more memorable in the sense that um, it was a place that was affordable. It was a place that allowed for them to um, not only rear children, but welcome others who um, from Uganda who would come uh, in the intervening years when they first arrived. And, and so it served sort of as like an Ellis Island or a touch point uh, for our family uh, over the uh, over that course of time. And, um, you know, it was a very modest, simple place. It had roaches, it had mice. Um, you know, I remember one time there was a squirrel that kind of came through one of the, um, the air conditioning ducts. Um, so uh, it was definitely not a boring place to live, to say the least. Um, it, and so um, those pictures are sort of emblematic of my parents and uh, that place. Uh, this is when sort of we, I kind of come onto the scene. Um, so picture to the left is um, me and my sister uh, in front of the apartment building uh, that the one bedroom apartment was in. Um, and then it's actually me in the picture in the middle is me in the hallway uh, in a stroller um, at a very younger point. Um, uh, I think I believe I was probably like not even one yet. Um, and then uh, the other picture is of um, me and my older sister, uh, Hadija. And so uh, all of this is um, sort of the beginnings of uh, sort of where I come from, uh, particularly in how we started life here in the, in, in at least how my parents started life here in America. Um, and so uh, these pictures are sort of, again, emblematic of that beginning. Um, and so from there, that's kind of how this all starts to uh, kind of fast forward. This is sort of more of pictures or articles from uh, the previous run, um, but it kind of gives you the arc of time uh, in terms of sort of where I've started and sort of where I kind of currently am right now. Um, it's an interesting uh, journey and we'll delve into it a bit more, but, you know, I think part of what has been sort of always at the front and center of me or at the, the heart of it is, you know, being able to kind of um, think back to the more simple and more challenging times in my life and trying to make sense of how to go forward and try to do the best that I can. Um, in particular, um, politics, but in particular around housing. Um, as I was mentioning, I grew up in a little one bedroom apartment um, that my parents, I think, probably paid around four or $500. Um, and it wasn't even rent stabilized, but uh, it just goes to show you that um, you know, it would be incredibly difficult for others to find the ability to make a home like that um, in this current sort of uh, economic situation we have in the city. And so I've tried to pour my heart and uh, my mind into trying to at least make a difference on that front uh, and using politics as a means uh, to be able to push that forward. And so um, that's sort of kind of the, the arc of things now. Um, my current job, um, aside from uh, trying to be a Democratic, trying to earn the Democratic nomination to be a, a member of the House in New York's ninth congressional, uh, is I'm currently the strategy and innovation officer for the local initiative support corporation. And it's one of the largest nonprofit organizations dedicated to revitalizing communities and uh, bringing greater economic opportunity to residents all across the United States. Our genesis, our beginning is New York City, but um, we now operate in over 35 cities across the country, uh, trying to, in effect, uh, help and support those uh, on the ground that are trying to 
make um, affordable housing a, a reality, trying to create greater opportunity, trying to make small businesses thrive, trying to help folks on all sorts of different fronts that would create, again, the kind of opportunity that would uh, allow for people to live out their version of the American dream. And so I've been there trying uh, for the for over a year, trying to help uh, the organization think about places it should enter, places it should, uh, you know, really consider its energy and focus and resources toward. And um, that's sort of where I've been uh, over the course of the year. Um, so how I got here um, is an interesting uh, place um, and we've touched on it a bit. Uh, so my parents started um, in going a, a bit deeper. My parents were uh, refugees who came from uh, fleeing the Civil War. My dad got here in 1980. Um, his first stop was a INS detention center um, where in Elizabeth, New Jersey, where he spent some time before having his petition for asylum granted. Uh, from there, he worked a number of odd jobs, um, McDonald's, janitor, security guard, uh, you name it, he did it. And um, it took him about five years to save up enough money uh, to bring my mom over. Um, once, but my mom had lived through the Civil War, um, and the Civil War was quite a painful chapter, uh, not only for her but and her family, uh, but for the country as a whole. Um, my grandmother uh, had was unaccounted for for a good significant chunk of the time of the war, um, and it's only through I think aid workers uh, working in some of the remote parts that um, my mom had figured out that her mother was actually still alive. Um, so, you know, coming to this country, I think for them was not only sort of a matter of, you know, opportunity and wanting to create a better life for themselves, uh, but also just a matter of life and death. Um, and so when they got here, uh, they started uh, really from the beginning. My parents both got GEDs. Um, my mom uh, and my dad both went to CUNY. Uh, my dad went to John Jay College. My mom went to uh, LaGuardia Community. Uh, my dad, it took him about 15 years to finish his uh, first degree, and my mom, it took her about, um, she never finished, in fact, uh, but she went periodically over the course of five years and just had to raise us and send money back home and uh, just couldn't find the time to, to finish. But eventually they found work as social workers, and they, um, you know, poured their heart and their devotion to not only us, but to sending um, money back to folks in Uganda, to helping raise children whose uh, parents had been lost in the war, uh, who had you know, passed on as a result of AIDS or HIV. Um, and so, you know, their sort of spirit and sort of uh, ethos kind of always permeated our house, which was you know, what are you going to do with the opportunities that you're given? Uh, because uh, life and death can come quite quickly on you. And so I've tried to live every day uh, sort of in that vein. Uh, so I guess this is kind of how I kind of get to Pennington on the whole. And, um, you know, it sort of happened kind of in uh, sort of by happenstance in some respect, uh, had an uncle, um, family friend really, but um, someone who my dad had known for uh, since he had been here in, uh, in America and they had known each other in Uganda. Uh, and, you know, he kind of goes to my dad one day and says, well, you know, Adam doesn't seem to really be uh, challenged in school. Uh, but he seems to be getting good grades and, you know, things seem to be, really be working out for him. Uh, but he's just playing video games all day. Uh, and so my dad comes to me with a list of schools 
uh, and says, you know, you should really, you know, your uncle Badru thinks that, you know, you should probably check some of these out. But this was at ninth grade. Uh, at the time I was going to a public high school here in the city. And um, I kind of brushed it aside saying like, you know, as most of us who grew up in the hood, like, why are you trying to send me away? I'm not a juvenile delinquent, the whole bit. And kind of shelved the idea uh, at ninth grade. You know, at the same time, I was turning 14. Uh, you know, I started high school at 13. Uh, but turning 14, uh, you kind of sort of seeing my friends around me. Uh, and a lot of bad outcomes were sort of starting to have its seeds be rooted uh, at that time. Uh, folks started selling drugs. Folks stopped going to school. Some of our friends are getting pregnant. Uh, and so, you know, I, it's at that point where you're just like, you know, what am I going to do with my life here? Um, and so I said, you know, I started looking up the schools that my dad had given me from the original list and thought, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Um, let's just see and take a look. And so uh, I'll never forget it. The first place I went to uh, to visit was a place called Choke, uh, Rosemary Hall. Uh, my mom had taken the day off from work uh, and we drove up uh, to Connecticut on the Merritt Parkway. Uh, as someone who grew up in the city my whole life, I had actually never even been uh, on that highway. Um, and so, you know, you get there and you see a school that looks like a college and uh, it's a high school. And, you know, looking around, you start to realize, like, maybe this is a different opportunity than the one that I've been given already. And it's at that point that I start to say, okay, uh, let's try and do this sort of whole uh, boarding school thing. And I uh, got into Pennington um, on a scholarship and um, tried to make the most of it. Um, I will say it was a bit isolating of an experience, um, being away from home, uh, being in a different social environment. Uh, I come from a working class uh, immigrant family. Uh, most of my peers were largely white, um, many of them um, extremely wealthy, uh, many of whom uh, probably didn't have hung, hang out with many of the people that I grew up with. And so um, it was in actuality and in reality, very, very painful to go through it at times. Uh, but I just tried to make the best of it and uh, told my dad and my mom, like, look, you know, uh, as they would have said, look, it's not everything is is easy, but, you know, you got to get through this. It's a good opportunity. And um I tried to make the most of it. So played sports, took honors classes, uh, and tried to prepare myself to, to go to college, uh, which I eventually did. Um, and uh, went to a school called Haverford afterward. Um, but uh, proved to be a pivotal moment in my life and um, probably changed the trajectory of uh, what I was probably intending or probably going to end up doing uh, so. And, you know, as a result of going to Pennington and Haverford, um, I have found that I wanted to not leave those places or those communities or the friends that I had behind, but actually wanted to go back uh, to it. And um, that meant, you know, going back and doing organizing work uh, when I probably could have probably made some more money in life uh, or tried to pay off uh, whatever little debts or things that I had. Uh, and as a result, um, you know, uh, that experience of, you know, leaving and coming back uh, and being in the community and working in the community, um, I, you know, found a way to sort of, um, you know, give, you know, see firsthand what our 
our challenges in our district, in particular central Brooklyn, um, seeing firsthand folks struggling to pay rent, seeing folks trying to find a decent school to send their kids to, uh, trying to find a meaningful opportunity um, that will allow them to pay the escalating rent. Um, and so I chose uh, public service as a path in wanting to give back uh, and in wanting to help my neighbors sort of, you know, build the kind of lives that my parents were fortunate to build and uh, were grateful to, to have. And, you know, it's, would have, it would be impossible for me to not have been able to do that stuff without sort of networks and people and access that um, I think would have not been there. It would have been pretty difficult to, to make, uh, make do without. And so, you know, I think of the folks of color who share similar backgrounds like myself, but we're also fortunate to go to, uh, you know, private school and to, to college and um, to places like Haverford and, to, and the like. Um, I think of those networks as being extremely helpful in uh, sort of the things that I've wanted to do, uh, the things that I've, the places that I've wanted to chart uh, and the directions that I've wanted to go in. Um, and so a couple of them uh, I've wanted to highlight, MLT for instance, is uh, for folks who are people of folks of color who are looking to go to uh, business school. Um, and so it is a fantastic program that helps uh, not only folks with business school, but career prep and making sure that we have uh, diversity in all levels in corporate America. SEO is another one uh, that has been, uh, many of my friends, uh, many of my classmates have gone through. Uh, it has allowed for folks who wanted to pursue careers in finance and business and the like to be able to not only access those companies, but also have mentors uh, and have a support network with each other as they kind of move through the ranks. And then there's CUP, uh, which um, is uh, sort of much uh, for folks in mid-career um, and the like and um, as they help, as help thing, helping them grow and build uh, together. The irony of, I think, me listing all of these, uh, these three networks is I actually never participated in any of them. Um, uh, MLT, SEO, and uh, CUP, I, I've actually not uh, done any of the programs associated with it, but many of my closest friends have, and uh, I've, been able to lean on uh, many of them as they've kind of gone through the, the pipe and, and pipe, pipeline. Um, I think for me, uh, the other thing that I think would uh, is sort of helpful and, um, you know, very important is how do you, as you kind of grow and become uh, leaders and sort of folks who are active in the community. Um, sort of what are the role models um, that you will seek or want to become or mentors you'll have, uh, advice from friends and the like. And um, I think the important um, thing for me um, was, you know, during those periods of you know, I think from Pennington through Haverford, um, there was a lot of, I think, self-reflection on my part. Um, I didn't have to grapple with a lot of, I think, the other questions that many of my classmates were sort of going through at the time. Um, I didn't have questions around identity. Um, I knew more or less who I was, um, whether it was from race or from gender or from class, um, those were settled questions in my head. Um, I also had sort of um, benefit of having gone to after Pennington Haverford, 
which I think was an insightful and again, reflective period for me to sort of think through uh, what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be, um, how did I want to make a difference in the world? And sort of those questions, I think were boiled down to what were, what were my values? Uh, what did I value? Um, you know, what were the things or ideals that I believed in? Um, what was I good at? You know, um, I think it's important to ask yourself and to be honest about, you know, if you are someone who is good at math, then, you know, lean in on that and see how that can play. But if you're not, you know, what are you good at? I think there's, everyone has some talent that uh, I think uh, can be brought out. Um, and then what are you interested in? Um, sort of what sparks to you, what gets you out of bed in the morning. Um, and ideally you would want to find at the intersection of those questions, your values, your skills, your interest. Um, in the middle of that or the nexus of that is um, what you should be doing in life. Um, and so I think for me during that period, um, there was just sort of a lot of kind of deep thinking uh, off more in quiet <laughs> spaces to try to think through that. Um, and, you know, I think some books that I think have been helpful in sort of illuminating other, how others thought about what they wanted to do with their lives or what they were hoping to do with their lives uh, was you know, Letters from a Birmingham Jail by Martin Luther King. Uh, I mean, it's a, I think he writes an insightful sort of way about his purpose and what he thought his role and mission in life were. And back to those values, skills, and interests, how he thought he might best be able to create a, a dynamic um role for himself, but uh, for his people as well. Uh, a Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela. Um, I think uh, in a very similar uh, vein to Martin Luther King, you know, when you spend decades on Robben Island um, and you are viewed as sort of not only a leader of your people, but as a, a beacon or a symbol of um, resistance and hope, um, how do you reconcile that with the fact that you can't uh, live out a free life, I think, um, in many ways for many years? I think um, Mandela, uh, I think, again, is a useful uh, touch point in, in doing and talking about that. And I think one book that probably um, is you know, surprisingly, and maybe not surprisingly, but um, I think is a sort of helpful and impactful um, lens or book um, is More Than Words uh, by Mario Cuomo. It's a collection of his, <coughs> sorry, um, a collection of his speeches uh, over the years, um, for those who might not know, Mario Cuomo is the father uh, of the current governor, and he himself served as governor um, during the 80s and early 90s, um, and is often thought of as a sort of reflective um, and uh, thoughtful uh, governor of the state. Uh, and I think his grappling of questions in a very profound and intellectual way, I think is a helpful book. Um, but these are just some books for, you know, sort of inspiration uh, and books that I've sort of, you know, really tried to kind of grapple with and sort of make sense of through my much younger years. Um, but they're just a sample size. I think uh, if you are trying to make a difference in the world, um, there are many ways to do that. 
politics is one realm, activism is another realm. Um, but you can you can make your your case or make your point. Uh, I think in a different kind of way um, that does not necessarily always have to lend itself to public discourse. Uh, but that gets back to uh, values and interests and um, skills, uh, questions that I think you have to internally reflect on. Uh, and then I think go to others to see how they uh, sort of uh, grappled with them uh, as well. Um, so this is uh, our email. Uh, folks can uh, shoot us a note and um, we'll happily respond. Um, but I believe that for many of you at this particular moment in time, uh, y'all are kind of going um, through a journey um, that is in many ways similar to me. Uh, I grew up um, with very modest means. It was not necessarily clear that, you know, my mom jokes around like, you know, it was not clear the day that I was born that this would be the, the life that I would choose. Uh, she was hoping I would buy her a house in Scarsdale. Uh, up in Westchester rather than doing this crazy thing like running for office. Um, but, you know, I think the seeds of that um, may may have not necessarily said personally, OK, you're going to run for office. But like the seeds of uh, pursuing public service, um, I think in many ways comes from her and comes from my parents because they were willing to sacrifice so much. Uh, to see us through. And I just genuinely believe that, um, you know, my family has been an anchor in my life. And many of y'all will have anchors in your lives who uh, will push and propel you and uh, do everything that they can uh, to see you succeed. And so lean on them. Uh, I know many of you probably have a lot of obligations in life. Um, first of which you probably, some of you probably have to help your families, uh, economically, uh, and in other ways have responsibilities that are beyond, uh, your, your, your age. And you've had to grow up quite fast. I, in many ways I had that too. Um, and so, uh, but at the same time, uh, as you're trying to take responsibility for your family and trying to help them. Uh, the question then becomes is sort of how are you going to make uh, a difference in the world um, on the whole and how are you going to make a difference in your community? And so to me, I think that's an important, uh, those are important questions that you've got to ask. And, um, you know, I hope that uh, this is an insightful uh, first step to thinking about that and to being a part of that and uh, hopefully uh, moving the ball forward in whatever you would like to do in your, your lives. And uh, if I can be of assistance to that, I, I'm happy to help. Uh, so I think uh, we're on for questions, if I remember correctly. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I can ask uh, some clarifying questions because I do think there's much to your journey that we need to that would be great to delve into um, just to sure. get more um, insight into how you actually got to where you are now. But in, in um, addition to uh, kind of this email, is there another way that students can contact you? Do, are you? do you feel comfortable with that? If not, then we can always make Yeah, yeah. I, I, can, I can pass along our, my contact, the other contact info uh, through you, I guess, at all. So we're happy to do that, too. So mm -hmm. folks, just reach out directly to me. I'm happy to do that. Great. Yeah. Um, we always want to make sure that anyone who's looking to um, take a, even a piece of your journey and has questions about it can reach out. Yeah. So Absolutely. You went to Pennington. Is that Pennington upstate? Is that upstate New York? Uh, no. So that's uh, Pennington in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> so by Princeton. Okay. Uh, the, Pen the Pennington School? I was just trying to Yeah, share. the Pennington School, yeah. The Pennington School. So I'm going to share my screen here. 
don't mind all the tabs that I have open. Um, did that work? Let's see. And the reason I want to share my screen is just to kind of talk about the Pennington School and how that maybe um, really was a pivotal point in your life. Are you still able to hear me okay on my computer? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, so it, it was, was it a private school from what I'm looking at online? Yeah, it was a private independent school. Uh, so it was both boarding and day, but I went as a boarding school, uh, as a boarding student. So given, you know, you talked about your parents' early journey um, and then they uh, fleeing a civil war in Uganda and really having to um, figure out their lives here. If you can speak a little bit more as I pull up these pictures, speak a little bit more as to kind of how they first integrated, what kinds of positions, maybe, you know, even speaking to the life they had back in Uganda, if they, you know, many immigrants who do come here, um, maybe with certain certifications or certain kinds of lifestyles that they've already been assuming in their country of origin. Um, and when they're fleeing, uh, especially as refugees, they then have to come here and live a starkly different life. Maybe they're not in the same types of positions. So what did that look like for your parents specifically? How did they manage to build up a life that, that then afforded you a, um, a private school education, um, especially a boarding school education, which I think may have um, contributed a lot to your, your leadership journey? Uh, yeah, so my parents, when they first got here, um... Again, they started very, very modestly. My dad worked at McDonald's uh, in the beginning. Uh, he worked at Dunkin' Donuts. He was a janitor. Um, so, it, while, while, uh, sorry, my sorry to interject. If you could actually slide or go back to the picture of your parents, because I can't oh see sure, that. yeah. So um, I think their their beginning was uh, a bit a bit a bit different than. Um, probably what they had anticipated. Um, my parents come from different, uh, I think, families in, in Uganda. So my dad comes from a, a family of more or less farmers um, in um, outside of Kampala, the main city. And so they were basically shepherds uh, and folks who like sold stuff in the marketplace. Uh, very modest family, uh, not of any particular means. I, my mom probably grew up in a very different background. Um, she grew up on a, she grew up in rural Uganda, but her father was a, you know, a big supplier of coffee. Uh, and so she kind of, you know, as we joke, she kind of had a relatively uh, sort of nice uh, existence in Uganda before the war sort of broke out. Uh, when they got here, it was all starting at the bottom. Uh, I mean, uh, my mom's first job was a home health aide, uh, which I'm sure uh, many of the folks who are listening either know someone or who, who is. Give me one second as sure? my screen is frozen because of this and I can't put myself on mute. Go ahead now, please. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my mom started off home health aid, uh, was a, you know, helping folks who were mentally uh, challenged. And uh, over the years, she sort of grew into the role uh, and became um, more senior in it. But it was a very just starting out in on the bottom. My dad, same job, home health aid. Uh, that's what allowed for him to go to school and eventually he became an administrator. Um, by the way, my parents could never afford Pennington. I think the tuition at the time was like $40,000 um, a year. Uh, so I went there on a scholarship. Um, so otherwise I would have just stayed my behind here in, in New York uh, and had gone to school here. But I think for, for them, that was the opportunity that had come. So, um, yeah, I think Could it's you speak to anybody who might be like, especially our younger audiences, um, if they wanted to be eligible for a scholarship, how do they, one, what would they have to do? And yeah. Then find out about the scholarship. Uh, so as the running joke or the running theme is, 
I know about all these programs like SEO and COP and MLT. There's another great one, uh, two great ones uh, that are geared specifically to helping uh, children of uh, lower and middle, uh, lower and working class families, particularly of color, uh, go to private schools is Prep for Prep uh, mm-hmm. and ABC, A Better Chance. Uh, and so those are two great programs that uh, help uh, kids uh, like myself um, from working class backgrounds um, to get to schools uh, like um, Pennington and and the like. Um, So I would encourage folks to, uh, if you want to, to check those out. Uh, I actually did it in a very odd order. I applied at 11th grade without any of the programs and sort of just kind of got the crapshoot worked out in that I was able to get to Pennington uh, through that. So, yeah. That's amazing. And so 11th grade, that's already when you're looking in, some of our students are looking into college, Mm -hmm. um, taking the SATs, et cetera. So what did you do in the ninth and 10th grade that, that made you stand out specifically for, I mean, 11th grade, um, you know, you're, you're now going into a community that I guess it's a two, two part question. You're going into a community where they've already had these students for some yeah. time. Um, so you're coming in, which means you must have really set out on the application. So what would you recommend there? And then also one of the pictures that I was hoping to share if my screen share decided to work was um, one of the last pictures on Google is in their cafeteria. And you can tell me if this was true for that time. There's a number of uh, different flags from different countries. So yeah. was the campus very international um, in general? What was the student body like? Yeah, so I think uh, taking the first question, for me, the, the challenge I think was interesting in that I wish I knew what the draw was. I, I've often reflected on that question because um, not every school that I applied to at 11th grade let me in. Um, it's pretty competitive from, and again, I did not know that at the time. I think had I known that it was hard, I probably might've thought twice about it, but uh, I've kind of looked at it and said, well, there's nothing to lose. Worst case scenario, you don't get in, you stay here and it'll be fine. Um, So I I looked at it as sort of a, let's just roll the dice and see how it plays out. Uh, But I do think there were a couple of things that may have helped was I I was just an unusual 11th grade applicant in the sense that I was applying from a public school, working class community, um, not many folks with my background sort of generally apply to those schools at that particular period. So I think it was more scarcity sort of issue that there just wasn't that many people per se like me. Um, I think um, what also helped was, you know, I was just open. I think a lot of the interviews that I went to, I just said, look, I really want the opportunity to just kind of create a better life um, and try to do as best as I can. And if, if I'm given the opportunity, I'll work my tail off and um, I won't disappoint. And so uh, I, I kind of went into it sort of in that uh, manner. I guess you want to call it humble or whichever. Um, but just saying, like, I'm, I'm happy to do whatever it takes uh, to make this work. Um, the other, I guess, to the second part, the, the more direct question about Pennington. Uh, yeah, it was somewhat international. I mean, there were a lot of folks, particularly from Asia, um, so had a lot of classmates who, again, but they were very well to do in Asia. I mean, if folks who are living in Korea and India sending their children here, um, they generally were the elite in that part of the world. And so uh, a lot of the flag, the flags represented all the countries that were represented um, at Pennington um, or folks' sort of nationality or country of origin. That's incredible. I mean, that I would say would add, I mean, for me, if I see, if I had seen that, or if I had been part of that community, 
um, would really inform kind of my path towards leadership being from a, you know, representing different diverse voices, um, yeah. being a leader. So how would you say, what, you know, what happened next? And you can speak to either whatever activities you did in, at Pennington um, that focused specifically on your leadership skills. So if you were part of any sports, if you were part of any clubs, if you took on a leadership um, role at clubs, because that's where a lot of our students are right now. Um, so what did you do? And then also um, to add to that, or if you want to speak more broadly, how did those activities um, then help you get into undergrad and then decide, you know, decide on business school and then now in politics? Um, I would say, I would assume that maybe that microcosm of, of uh, community then helps you become that leader of diverse voices. Yeah, no, I think it was a, um, to me, I think, Again, I think I was grappling with a lot at the same time, which was one, I felt that this was a isolating experience. It was so different than what I, at the same time, I, back to sort of what I was, you know, my hope or intent was like, I want to make a difference in the world. I'm trying to uh, make this work. So whatever it takes, let's just do it. Um, and so I, found myself just playing football. I found myself running track. Uh, I was, um, I was in part of the newspaper. Um, I was signing up for everything that I could to just sort of try to make a difference in the new orbit that I was in, even though I felt the orbit was so strange, so different, so not what I was used to. Uh, and so instead of kind of repelling or recoiling from it, I just threw myself into it. Um, and I think that sort of served well when I got to Haverford. Um, the transition was a lot smoother and just a lot more uh, peaceful in many ways because I had had those two years away to sort of get used to um, one just being on my own, um, I'd left for Pennington at 15. And so, you know, a lot of my peers who were at Haverford, uh, some, you know, at least the folks who come from backgrounds like myself, who hadn't gone to like a boarding school or a private school, you know, there was an adjustment period to just being there. Uh, and uh, I think that learning curve was a lot shorter for me than, um, uh, maybe most. I think at the same time, again, starting from where I wasn't fitting, moving in at like 11th grade, like I was now starting with a class that I was going to finish with. Um, that was, that was also great as well. So I, again, threw myself into students council, uh, honors council, uh, being a, a president of the black student league, um, just taking initiative where I could and uh, running with it. Uh, spent my junior year at the London School of Economics. So um, all of it to say was even in environments where I was, you know, learning or trying to figure it out, I just threw myself into it um, and just said, you know, let me let me just try to make this work. Um, and I think that was something that helped probably get me to uh, business school down the road and uh, probably has served well in many ways in trying to run for office because you just kind of need to throw yourself into it. Uh, there's kind of no training wheels uh, behind it. And I think, you know, so many of our um, students do have um, a similar family, uh, like a family structure as not family structure as yours, but um, similar experiences to yours. So how would, you know, there is some sort of, uh, for many families, maybe a level of discomfort, especially with um, the journeys that they've had to then uh, make sure that their students, that their children are going out and experiencing the world. And it's more of a, let's, you know, let's make sure that the community is, I'm not answering, I'm not asking this question properly. Let me try to say it again. So many of our, many of our students come from families where there is a sense of, you know, um, not a lack of understanding or that these are activities that your child should do. Mm -hmm. um, 
a, maybe a fear, right? Or some sort of- Yeah, word. being insular. Uh, I, it's part of it is, you know, you just kind of want to keep your head down and sort of right. you know, just make sure you're not rocking the boat. But I think part of what I think is important is, and I think it just goes generally with the climate in which we live in is we need communities, particularly immigrant communities and immigrant communities of color to speak up, to take action, to be involved, uh, to have a voice, to have a stake. Uh, this is as much our community as any others. And uh, it's important that all of y'all who are sort of listening that, yes, I know there's family obligations and I know there's uh, issues that you've got to um, kind of manage and sort of take care of, but you also have to, we also have to make and carve out and make sure that those who follow us or those who will come from wherever down the road also feel like um, they have a vested stake in the country as well. And so uh, all that to say is whatever environment you're in, um, just be an active participant in it uh, because your voice is important, not only for the current conversation, uh, but for those who will come after you. Right. And that's, you do have a sister you mentioned. Did you ever, um, most, the, the target audience that we have with mostly young women, um, and then many of our mentors are, are women. So there's always that additional struggle, especially when you're coming from communities and cultures that maybe, um, you know, there's, there's gendered expectations, there's gendered mm -hmm. roles. So given that you have a, I mean, because you have a sister, can you speak to that a little bit? Was she able to um, maybe have the same kind of, you know, free experiences where you got to go to boarding school and yeah no i my sister <laughs> my sister actually did not want to go to boarding my older sister went to boarding school but my younger one just was like no I, i'm not doing that um but there was always it, the ball was always in our court and I, I think i credit that to my dad uh in which it was a very egalitarian uh view and <laughs> i think he's a feminist in the truest sense and that Everybody, every, the next, it's just the next person up. So uh, I think uh, for him, he probably challenged a lot of the gender norms that, you know, I think were perver pervasive in uh, Ugandan culture and my mom as well. Uh, they both had probably a different outlook on things that than most people uh, in their sort of age range and uh, group probably had. and. I think that's sort of how our outlook has sort of formed as well. That's fantastic, yeah. So I, I guess, you know, part of what I'm hearing is that you have definitely experienced discomfort, but you also realize that in that discomfort, you were going to figure out ways to succeed. And that's why you threw yourself into football, into the paper, into yeah. newspaper school, and then that made it easier for you to then be in leadership positions and be in uncomfortable spaces as you got, um, you know, as you got older. So is that, I mean, if you want to speak to kind of final yeah. words to that, because many of our students always talk about that, that, you know, we don't feel welcome or we don't feel like we're supposed to be in the space. Yeah, um, yeah. The syndrome is heavy. Um, so if you want to give some final piece of advice, particularly around that discomfort to being a leader. Um, you were breaking up a bit, so I didn't hear some of it. Um, you wouldn't mind repeating just kind of a quicker version of it. I just, sorry sure. about that. No, that's okay. I think it's my computer that's stalling. Um, it's the, the discomfort of being a leader that, that made you throw yourself into activities and that made it comfortable for you to then go on to Haverford, even though it was um, still a different environment and go on to HBS, Harvard Business School. So the discomfort in leadership or the discomfort in trying, um, starting off as a leader. Do you want to speak to no, I that? think I would say in many ways, you know, again, as although at the time I thought Pennington was sort of the worst experience in the world, um, I think in many ways it just sort of prepared me and, and I'm grateful for it in that uh, leadership is, to your point, it's getting comfortable with discomfort. <laughs> uh, and if you do it enough times, you will eventually find that the discomfort is not discomfortable at all, but uh, a thing that you lean into uh, and help 
others who may be experiencing discomfort uh, try to elevate themselves. And um, that I found um, to be, again, lessons that I took from my parents who uh, are unconventional in many ways. I think they probably deserve their own presentation on, on their style themselves, but um, they just sort of leaned into challenge um, more so than any other people that I've ever seen. And that's probably why they've been together for so long. Um, they've just been through so much together. <laughs> I mean, a civil war, um, trying to eke out a living in America. It has been a interesting ride for them. And I, I think from it's through their example that, um, you know, I sort of draw inspiration from uh, in order to sort of move the ball forward on whatever I choose to do, even in politics. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of kind of where we're at with that right now. Great. Thank you for that. I mean, we just started our leadership journey for our new student leaders who are called ambassadors yesterday. Mm -hmm. They went through their first part of their leadership orientation. And, um, you know, there's a lot of hesitation. There's a lot of a lot of comments around. I don't think yeah. yet. Um, and that's what just it is. Grow in, just, just lean into it. Lean into it. Exactly. And that's what we told them, too, that there is it's going to be uncomfortable, but you'll come out stronger at the end of it. So um, yeah. your journey clearly represents that. And, um, you know, we thank you for taking the time today to share your journey with us about leadership and, um, you know, the life, the life that you've had that got you to where you are now. So um, yeah. if uh, you want to connect with Adam, uh, just let us know and we will definitely um, connect you to Adam so you can speak more to his uh, or you can ask questions about his particular journey and how that might resonate with you. Thank you again for joining. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure and um, I'm happy to, to connect uh, with folks offline. Perfect. Appreciate it.